Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christopher Sullivan. I'm the Deputy Official Secretary to Her Excellency the Governor, and it's wonderful to have you all here at Government House. For those gathered here this evening in the House, I invite you now to sort of check mobile phones and pages. No one wants to be that person. Uh, and a particular welcome to all of those joining us live stream online, and of course, those who might be watching this post event on the Royal Society of New South Wales website and, and YouTube channel. Welcome to you as well. Ladies and gentlemen, will you need, please now stand for the arrival of our official party, the Honourable Andrew Bell, Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales, and Ms Joanna Bird, and Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, Governor of New South Wales. Please make them welcome. Good evening. I acknowledge the Gadigal, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present extend that respect to, to the elders of all parts of our country, acknowledging not only First Peoples' uh, continued custodianship of these lands, but also the living body of knowledge developed here for over 60,000 years. It's with great delight that I have the opportunity this evening as Lieutenant Governor, but in the presence uh, of Her Excellency uh, and speaking on her behalf tonight, uh, to welcome you all to Government House uh, on the occasion of the sixth iteration of the Ideas at the House uh, program, which is a terrific conception. In late 2019, this series of public events was conceived in collaboration with the Royal Society of New South Wales, of which the Governor is the patron, and its aim is to explore important and influential ideas to engage with matters of broad intellectual interest. COVID, of course, unfortunately intervened uh, in the plans for the uh, first three in-person forums of 2020 and 2021, uh, but they went online, which uh, carries the advantage, uh, which is sort of continued today, as this is also online of uh, broadening uh, the reach of uh, what will no doubt be, without applying any pressure to him at all, a quite outstanding uh, address by my friend Dr Valance, to whom I shall come shortly. So we're tonight able to enjoy both the conviviality of an in-person uh, meeting and uh, address and interaction uh, afterwards, I think led by Professor Iverson, uh, and the presence also of the online audience to whom welcome. The Royal Society of New South Wales is an organisation ideally suited to this partnership of inquiry, uh, as is uh, obvious to its members uh, and those with a uh, historical grasp that it extends, its foundation extends back to 1821 uh, and with uh, Sir Thomas Brisbane, the sixth governor of New South Wales, being its inaugural uh, president. So we're here uh, in the presence of an organisation which is more than 200 years old, which is older than the Supreme Court, which uh, I tell everyone I have a chance to, will be 200 years old on the 17th of May uh, next year. But the Royal Society of New South Wales uh, continues uh, strongly. And uh, I thank uh, the Royal Society for their efforts uh, and for their involvement uh, tonight. The uh, range of topics covered so far in the series is impressive. The titles uh, alone uh, pique curiosity and invite engagement. Professor Clancy, as title was 10, The Mapping of Colonial Australia. Tom Keneally, Australia and the Dickens Boys. Greater Bradman, Music as a Superfood. Uh, Professor Simons, Manufacturing at the Atomic Scale and proving that little, can, that little can escape the scope of the inquiring mind, Richard Tognetti's meditation on, quote, nothing, unquote. <laughs> Some of you may have heard that. Well, tonight, uh, we are in for uh, a, a treat, uh, and it's a, a huge personal pleasure uh, for me to be able to introduce someone who's not only a very uh, a highly distinguished public uh, intellectual, uh, but also a good friend uh, of mine. That's Dr John Valance, who uh, uh, I think all in this audience would know, a uh, scholar, uh, a critical thinker, uh, a sculptor, a musician, uh, a Renaissance man. Uh, John uh, 
uh, came through North Sydney Boys, Sydney University, Classics uh, Scholarship, uh, or Classics S Scholarship, uh, then to Cambridge. Don't know what happened about going to Oxford, but uh, Cambridge was, uh, it was closed. <laughs> uh, but uh, excelled uh, in Cambridge in the classics, but also as we will um, understand uh, tonight, not just the classics for the classics sake, but uh, uh, the philosophy of the classical mind and in particular Aristotle. He stayed there for eight years before he was called uh, back to these shores where uh, Sydney Grammar School, uh, that uh, great also historic school, was fortunate uh, to lure him initially as a senior master and then, of course, uh, for I think 18 years as uh, its headmaster, during which a whole generation of, uh, uh, I think, um, young men uh, were challenged, uh, stimulated, uh, provoked into um, deeper thought and the importance of uh, liberal education and uh, the universal benefit of an inquiring mind. He then uh, uh, took all of those um, skills and deployed them in a new environment uh, at the library and he has uh, had a transformational leadership uh, of our state library. And I only refer to the library bar, uh, which of course uh, many of us have had the opportunity to enjoy, uh, but the uh, the opening of the galleries, uh, the map room, the restoration of the reading room and uh, some exciting things, I think, which will occur in the next uh, little while. Um, not just uh, renovating and refurbishing, etc., but uh, rebroadcasting to the community the importance of the library as uh, an intellectual institution but also a public uh, institution. Uh, he has huge interests in the arts as well. Uh, uh, sat on the board of the Sydney Symphony. He sat on the board of the National Art School and was a member of the Library Council and he's some kind of arts czar at the moment uh, in charge of museums and things um, uh, in a role which is... Uh, uh, important, although slightly obscure. Um, <laughs> so he's going to uh, address uh, us tonight um, uh, on the following topic, Aristotle on life and thought in the sublunary sphere. John Vallis. Thank you so much, Andrew. Oh, very good. Your Excellency, Chief Justice, Ms. Bird, uh, friends too numerous to mention. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, as I was saying, thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, I'll start by saying that a couple of years ago up at the library, I met a, a very distinguished elder from Lake Mungo out in western New South Wales who was uh, doing an acknowledgement of country. And she came out, very f formal uh, environment, and she looked and said, Gadigal, nice place you got here. I've got a secret theory that our unique Australian sense of humour may have some origins in that ancient capacity to treat important things with a, a very light touch. Uh, and so when I acknowledge uh, the antiquity of the land we're on, um, I hope that you'll understand it in that spirit. Um, I want to say something about Aristotle tonight. Uh, it's not going to be an antiquarian lecture about philosophy. Uh, it's not even going to be a very technical lecture about philosophy. It's going to be quite a, a personal journey that I want to take you on to try and explain uh, the importance in my own career of Aristotle's philosophy. But along the way, I hope I may be able to give you some idea of why people like Aristotle were so important in antiquity as well as today. Uh, I want to try and give you some idea of why uh, it's important to know about Aristotle and why that knowledge could be of some practical use uh, to, I think, all of you today. Um, my father was a historian of science, he was a historian of geology, and he was very snooty about people like Aristotle because he said they were wrong about most of the things. And the reason that I've put sublunary sphere in the title of my talk 
tonight, is that Aristotle, as I'm sure you know, thought that the Earth was at the centre of the universe. He divided the universe up into concentric spheres, which the, uh, the Earth at the centre of it. Uh, and for Aristotle, the part of the universe that was uh, contained within a sphere represented by the orbit of the moon around the Earth, uh, which was composed of the elements earth, fire, air, and water, was called the sublunary sphere. Beyond that uh, was the province of something he called the fifth element, the quintessence, which was characterised by an eternal circular mo motion. Uh, and my father would say, that's all tosh, why do you bother about it? That's wrong. Uh, I think it's important to reflect that you can get things wrong. Even some modern scientists of my acquaintance have got things wrong, and it doesn't mean that their work is worthless. It doesn't mean that the way in which they think about things isn't significant. Uh, and so with that, in, by way of preparation, we're going to be talking about how Aristotle approached the world that's circumscribed by the orbit of the moon. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time, first of all, setting the scene. You probably won't be able to read these slides, but um, Aristotle is seen in many quarters as one of the most important natural scientists in history, but he's also regularly appearing in executive desk diaries. I just went to Google, and you find all these pithy sayings, these little things that every now and again uh, superannuated headmasters will wheel out at school assemblies to try and inspire people. It's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. You know, I think I used to use that from time to time. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no uh, education at all. We cannot learn without pain, I can think of. Um, now, all of this I'll be returning to in a minute uh, in the context of some of Aristotle's predecessors. But first of all, uh, we'll get uh, the biography, of some of the history of him out of the way pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, he came from one of the most unappealing parts of the world you could imagine uh, in central Macedonia, in what's now central Macedonia, really featureless, nasty play, a part of the Greek coast. I hope there isn't anyone here from the ancient town of Stagira. But I went there once, and it's very desolate. It was economically quite insignificant in antiquity. Uh, and Aristotle may, I mean, this is part of the archaeological remains of the ancient town of, Sk of Stagira, uh, where, uh, in fact, he, he grew up and then he left and went to Athens, it seems, as quickly as he possibly could. Uh, and he went from these very humble beginnings uh, to appearing in one of the most famous pictures in the modern Western tradition, which I'm sure you know, uh, Justice Spiegelman may not be able to see it from a strange angle, but uh, this is Raphael's painting, The School of Athens, the fresco in the Apostolic Palace in, uh, in Rome, in the Vatican, uh, uh, where you can see all the great figures of ancient thought uh, represented. We could, we could spend weeks talking about this picture. It is a truly remarkable painting. Um, a lot of these figures... Uh, we think we know who they are, but there's still argument about whether this is Archimedes and whether this is Cleanthes and so on. But these two figures in the middle, we do know. The chap with the beard on your left, who's got his finger pointing up like that, is Plato. And the chap on the left holding the book in his left hand and his hand out in front of him, the younger person, is Aristotle. Uh, and we'll be coming back to that picture at the end. Now, to set the scene for all of this, I'm going to have to give you a very, very brief uh, history of philosophy. It won't take very long, but otherwise a lot of what I'm going to say will be pretty much unintelligible. Uh, some of Aristotle's predecessors were particularly interested, and we're going right the way back to the earliest period of documented Western thought. Uh, they were very interested in uh, trying to find answers to the question of where things come from. What are the material origins of creation? Uh, can we reduce everything we see around us to a single element? Uh, and there's a chap called Thales of Miletus uh, um, in the east of Greece, out towards what's now Turkey, who lived on the coast, uh, and he thought that water had some kind of privileged status as an element. Um, Anaximenes of Miletus, uh, a little bit later, thought that air had some privileged status, some sort of elemental status. We don't need to dwell on this for too long. 
Um, Anaximander, a very interesting character, thought, well, you know, how can you tell it might be water or air and what does privileged status mean? Uh, the one thing we can say is that uh, the universe appears to be pretty large. And so he starts talking for the first time about concepts of infinity. Uh, he, it seems, is one of the very first people to say that the universe itself was infinite. Uh, people were very, very exercised about the idea of where the Earth was. Is the Earth in the centre of creation? Is the Earth somewhere else? Uh, and Anaximander is credited with developing something which modern philosophers sometimes call the principle of sufficient reason, which uh, argues that basically um, anywhere is the centre of the universe if it's infinite. So that's not really a particularly relevant question. These people keep, and there are lots of other people, who start arguing about what the elemental origins of creation are. And then there's a huge point of discontinuity in the history of Western thought with the arrival of Parmenides, of Elia, um, a colony in, in Italy, the south of Italy. Again, not a very significant economic place, but Parmenides a hugely significant figure in the history of thought. Parmenides, like many interesting people in history, had a dream. Interesting how many important discoveries come to people in a dream. Uh, and in his dream, uh, a goddess appeared to Parmenides and invited him for a ride on her chariot, uh, which is a sort of invitation that not many people would refuse. Uh, and they got to a fork in the road, and the goddess said, do you want me to take you down this road, which is the road of opinion, or do you want to go down this road, which is the road of truth? Uh, the evidence is very fragmentary, but it seems that Parmenides tried both of these roads, and the road of opinion is a road full of human disagreement, all these people arguing about who's right, who's wrong, about everything from the elemental origins of the universe to anything else. So he went down the road of truth, and in the road of truth he discovered that there's only one thing you can say with certainty, uh, and that is uh, that existence exists. There's the Greek verb esti, which means it is. And philosophers, being the perverse animals they are, have argued ever since whether uh, it is is the statement of existence or whether it, the subject of the verb to be, is something that exists. In the, we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> we don't know. Where we're. But the important thing about Parmenides is that if you believe that the only thing that exists is existence, then you're committed to denying all sorts of other things. And most significantly, you're committed to denying the possibility of change and of motion. Because if you say that the only thing that exists is existence, then existence has no room in which to move. Um, something can't be, go from here to there, because by saying it's there, it's not here, and any statement which involves a negation is logically impossible. Um, and so this leads to the development of a very interesting solution, which is associated with a philosopher called Democritus, who invented the atomic theory, according to tradition, uh, he also came up for a, a, a little town in the west of Macedonia. Uh, and he posited that the universe is made out of little indivisible bits of isness, of existence. But he got around the problem of motion and change by giving them room in which to move. He said, OK, you can say it is, but logically you should also be allowed to say it isn't. Uh, and so Democritus came up with this idea that you can have existence and non-existence, and the non-existence gives the existence room in which to move. And so the atoms, a pure existence and pure non-existence in the void, can then whiz around and create sort of molecules which then lead to the generation of everything we see in the phenomenal world around us. So all of this is going along quite happily. Uh, and then we have the last three people who are memorialized uh, largely, not entirely, but largely in Plato's dialogues. And the first is Socrates, um, who seems to have started life as, uh, as a sophist. The sophist was a, a, a person who traveled around the Greek world uh, in return for substantial amounts of money, offering to teach young, usually young men, but not always young men, um, how to be successful, or in particular, how to be virtuous. It's a bit like the modern private school. Not, not Sydney Grammar School, but I'm thinking, you know, Scots or, you know. Um, uh, and um, so 
it seems that Socrates was one of these people, that you'd send your, your children off and they'd have lectures in how to be uh, courageous or bold or virtuous or honest or how to understand the importance of friendship. And Socrates appears in Plato's dialogues as somebody who's actually casting doubt on all this. He says, who are these people? Are they fraudulent? Should they be charging money to teach virtues? He starts meeting these sophists and says, okay, sit down with me and tell me what is courage? Uh, for example, and one of them will say, well, courage is standing firm in battle. And he said, but couldn't courage also be facing a, a, a terminal disease or facing a, a different kind of challenge? That, surely that could be courage. It turns out that all these people who are teaching virtue don't really, according to Socrates, know what virtue is. Uh, they're, they're, they're basically charlatans um, because all they're doing is teaching characterizations of virtuous behavior. Uh, so Socrates starts getting very interested in the challenge of finding definitions of things. Uh, and we start to see uh, a very, very strong current of connection between ethical inquiry and scientific inquiry. So a lot of work that goes into the development of formal logic is mirrored in the development of ethical theory. So Socrates, in the end, decides that the one thing that all these different examples of virtue have in common is that they are associated in some way with goodness. Uh, and this then is picked up by Plato, who elevates the idea of goodness to something which becomes absolutely central in his philosophy. Uh, and it meets up with a very interesting cosmological line of thought, which is associated with a, an astronomer called Timaeus, who has a dialogue by Plato named after him. Timaeus starts looking at the origins of the cosmos, of the universe, and in the dialogue that Plato ascribes to him, uh, Timaeus talks about the origins of the world as being the result of the work of a creator who is trying to create, or as the best he can, creating the physical world that we live in uh, as the best possible copy of a perfect world which exists in the abstract, which is good, which is good, uh, good in every sense of the word. Uh, and so this ultimately leads Plato to what's uh, often known as the theory of forms, that everything we see around us is the physical manifestation of something which exists in a perfect, eternal, unchangeable, uncorruptible form somewhere else in an abstract. And so for Plato, all of education needs to be uh, aimed away from the physical world up to a point where you can contemplate goodness, you can contemplate perfection, you can contemplate things which aren't going to change. For Plato, things which change are inferior. All of us are inferior because we're mortal. Government house is inferior because one day it won't be here. Uh, but the form of government house, the form of us, if uh, depending on which bit of Plato you read, uh, that's a different thing because those things are worth studying, they are immortal. For Plato, one of the most practical ways in which humans can start thinking the right things is mathematics because mathematics uh, at least gives you some access to concepts and ideas which aren't going to waste away, which aren't going to die, which aren't going to be corrupted. Um, so when Plato starts talking about natural history, natural philosophy, when Plato starts talking about the origins of things around us, he takes the view that because they're made of matter, because they're not eternal, they are in some sense inferior. And so if you're going to be a scientist studying the world around us, you're doomed if you're going to be studying natural things because they're not really uh, worthy of human attention. What you really should do is think about the world beyond and that you're probably are familiar with the characterization of Plato's philosophy as a preparation for death. That when you die, your eternal soul will leave the physical body which has been corrupting it and go to a better place. And you can see why Christianity was so keen on Plato. So in that painting, Plato with his finger is pointing heavenwards and Aristotle is pointing somewhere very different. So let's think now, with that by way of background, uh, about Aristotle. 
Now, Aristotle, after Plato, is a huge change, another big discontinuity. Plato is saying, we can't really trust our senses, we just trust our mind. Our senses will only give us access to the material world, and the material world isn't really worth studying because it's so it's just not there for the long haul. What Aristotle says is, all men by nature desire to know. An indication of this is the delight we take in our senses. And above all the other senses, we delight in the sense of sight. There's a passage in Plato's Republic where they're talking about the value of studying astronomy. And, some, and somebody says, well, it's, it's wonderful. We can, we can look at the stars. Uh, and Plato says, we don't want to look at the stars. If we look at the stars, we'll find things that actually don't submit to proper uh, rational explanation. We should think about the stars. We don't want to look at them. So Aristotle is committed to looking at things, which is a huge, huge change. Aristotle is also very committed to finding ways of proving things which allow investigation. Um, in Plato's Timaeus, Plato at one point says, uh, we shouldn't expect rational explanations even to be on offer of the things we see in the physical world because of the nature of the physical world. And if we start asking too much, then we just destroy proof. So let's just forget about it. Plato takes, uh, Aristotle takes the opposite view and is very committed uh, to developing a logical system organised around uh, both deductive logic, um, syllogistic logic and inductive logic. Uh, logic, to work out ways of, of gathering phenomena uh, uh, and then drawing reliable conclusions from them. And again, in this passage you'll see, he says, and rhetorical arguments are the same as logical ones because they proceed either through examples, which is induction, or through enthymemes. I'm not sure if many of you have encouraged uh, encountered the phenomenon of the enthymeme. Enthymemes are rhetorical syllogisms. They're syllogisms that can be based on false premises, uh, but then can be built uh, in a logical sequence. Politicians use them all the time uh, in order to demonstrate something to a kind of plausible level of satisfaction. Um, and then Aristotle is also very committed to the search of search for elements. When the objects of an inquiry in any area have principles, causes, or elements, it's through acquaintance with these that knowledge and understanding is attained. For we do not think that we know a thing until we're acquainted with its primary elements. So in that respect, he's going right back to the very earliest traditions. Knowledge, though, he says, has its origins in axioms, hypotheses, and definitions which cannot themselves be proved. Aristotle uh, unlike Plato, is quite open on the, about the fact that mathematics geometry is actually predicated on things like the definition of a point and a line and a plane, which you cannot prove. They are axi axiomatic. You have to accept them, uh, and if you don't accept them, nothing further is possible. Um, beyond that, knowledge is grounded on endoxa, which are widely held opinions and phenomena, appearances. Aristotle draws a distinction between things that we can actually see with autoptic activity uh, and things which other people tell us. So in doxa might be what you read in Wikipedia or some, what someone told you at the pub or something like that. Phenomena tend, uh, in the more hardline interpretation, to be things that you've seen yourself and you have to feed all of these into the, your understanding. Uh, and then there is a really significant passage in his treatise on the parts of animals, which um, I won't read it all out, but those of you who can't see the screen, uh, he says, um, every realm of nature is marvellous. Now, Plato would never have said that. Um, and as Heraclitus, this is, I won't read it out because it's a bit unintelligible, but there's a lovely story Aristotle tells about the philosopher Heraclitus. Uh, some friends came around to visit him, and it says in the translation here uh, that he was warming himself at the furnace in the kitchen. And when his friends saw that that's what he was doing, they said, oh, no, we better come back another time. Um, warming his hands at the furnace in the kitchen is a euphemism. Uh, I won't explore the exact details of this euphemism, but you get the idea. He was up to something that uh, his friends found embarrassing, and he said, 
He said, no, come in, for there are gods even here. There are gods even here. And Aristotle in particular is associated with being prepared to study things that other people, not just his predecessors, but people of his own generation, were, thought were, were beneath them, thought were not worthy of study. Uh, he also talks about three different types of knowledge. There's a, a theoretical kind of knowledge. There's a practical kind of knowledge. And for Aristotle, practical means practical in the sense of assisting you in the leading of your own life. So practical knowledge for Aristotle is often related to ethics. Uh, and then knowledge which relates to the creative actualization of knowledge. Uh, and one of Aristotle's standard examples of the creative actualization of knowledge is poetry, is drama. And so we have three types of knowledge. There's theoretical knowledge, there's practical knowledge, and there's actualizing or poetic knowledge, which I think is a rather interesting idea. And in antiquity, Aristotle's works were broken up into these three broad categories, theoretical, practical, and productive. Now, this is very small type. There's a long list of the theoretical works, which I won't go into here. But at the top, in any great detail, that is, at the top, there's a group of works called the organon, which means the, the toolbox. It's the sort of bunnings of Aristotle, where he works out all the details of logic, how you prove something, what's the difference between deduction and induction, uh, how can syllogisms be constructed reliably. Um, mathematics, interestingly, Aristotle didn't get all that involved with mathematics, which is quite surprising given how much time Plato spent on it. Most of the work that he's, he, he gets he's known for in later antiquity is around natural sciences, the physics, metaphysics, um, work on the heavens, on generation and corruption, very important work that de deals with the nature of, of change, of motion and change, meteorology, weather. No one would have studied the weather um, before Aristotle. Uh, on sleep, on dreams, on divination through dreams, on the shortness of life, on colours. It goes on and on and on. And then he set up a big school and there were people carrying on his research literally for hundreds of years after his death. Uh, this was about the time, remember Aristotle was tutor to Alexander the Great, so uh, Alexander got Aristotle's pupils' uh, jobs on his uh, voyages out into the East. And so a lot of scientific knowledge was brought in from what's now India uh, and places like that. The practical treatises tend to be the ethical treatises, and you'll be familiar with many of these names, the Nicomachean Ethics, the Magna Aurelia, the Eudemian Ethics, Politics, the Economics. The Economics is uh, a very interesting work about the regulation of the household. That's what economics means. Um, and uh, a lot of Aristotle's prejudices, social prejudices, which tend to alienate people today. Um, you know, his acceptance of slavery as a natural state, um, his idea that uh, lending money at interest is dishonourable uh, because that means money is basically parasitic if all you're doing is investing it at interest. Um, his his uh, prejudice against retail trade. You know, a lot of a lot of sort of class-based prejudices in the in the Western tradition have their origins uh, in in works like this, and also, of course, in Plato. Uh, and then the productive treatises, um, the rhetoric. These are the creative ones: how to give speeches, how to persuade people. Um, Greek society, very, very much like society today, is organised around this idea that if you want to get ahead in, in life, you have to be able to persuade people of your own point of view. Um, one of my teachers once characterised it as learning how to see off the opposition. It doesn't matter if you're right or, right or wrong, you have to be able to see off the opposition. Um, and then the poetics. The book of the poetics that survives is the book about tragedy. Uh, any of you remember the Umberto Eco novel, The Name of the Rose, organised around the, the lost work of Aristotle's poetics, which is about comedy. Um, I'd love to be able to spend more time talking about these things, but I'm going to have even more heavy eyelids than I can see already. Um, uh, the, the poetics is particularly interesting because I think it's been misunderstood in the West for hundreds of years, uh, especially by school children and tried to understand the nature of tragedy. Um, maybe we can come back to that later. 
Now, this is where it becomes a little bit more personal. Aristotle has a slogan in Greek. It's a phrase, totienenai, the what it is to be something. Uh, and when he's a, approaching the challenge of explaining something, and it doesn't matter what it is, uh, it could be explaining the governor, it could be explaining the chief justice, it could be explaining a pot plant in the garden, you have to be able to answer four questions about it if you want to give a satisfactory explanation of why it exists in the way that it does. You have to be able to say, explain what it's made of, or what he or she is made of, you have to be able to give an account of why it has the form, the shape it has. You have to be able to explain how it came to be in the first place. Uh, and then the most important one of all is the what's it for, the what's it for. Um, just as Plato's universe is created by this demiurge, the creator, who's trying to make the best possible world out of material which actually doesn't, doesn't work all that well, um, Aristotle also believes that nature has an impulse towards what's best, what's good, although Aristotle doesn't seem to believe in a god. Plato does seem to have this strange creator figure, but Aristotle doesn't. He does, however, believe that there's a very powerful impulse in nature towards what is best, and that's seen in his natural science as much as in his ethics. And so you see here in the Nicomachean Ethics, every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and choice is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has been rightly declared to be that at which all things aim. And so we have the same good that we we're hearing about in the context of Plato's ethics. That This is something where Aristotle and Plato are on the same page. We then have to start talking about motion and change. And... Uh, in, a, in an age before Isaac Newton, uh, Aristotle believed that if something's going to be moving, it has to be in constant contact with what's moving it. And the moment uh, what's being moved loses contact with what's moving it, it stops. So there has to be something that's constantly moving everything else. Everything that's in motion must be moved by something. And if something has not the source of its motion in itself, it's evident that is moved by something other than itself, and there must be something else that moves it. And as I said earlier, for move, also read change. This is also part of the a very important analysis of how change occurs. And the perfect form of movement is the movement that's characterized above the sublunary sphere, which is not appearing in today's film, uh, and that's characterized by a circular eternal motion that goes round and round. And then there are other things, there's a hierarchy of things that are moving other things, until finally you get to a point where there has to be the end of the road. There has to be something that's moving everything else, but it can't be being moved itself. Uh, and this is, again, one of the trademark doctrines of Aristotle, the doctrine of the unmoved mover. But interestingly, it's not just a physical concept, it's also an ethical concept. Uh, and so... He has this idea of the unmoved mover also applied to human behavior and also to human thought. The object of desire and the object of thought move without themselves being moved. Uh, and there's one of the most beautiful lines in any language. Uh, in, ancient, in, in Aristotle's metaphysics, the line is kine de hos eromenon. It moves by being the object of love. Uh, and that sentence underpins the whole of Aristotle's dynamics, that the universe, motion, change, at its, whole, at its absolute heart, has this concept of love. And he never really explains what he means by it, but it's a very, very powerful one. Uh, but, uh, and it also, I think, underpins a, a lot of his teleological assumptions, that everything that happens in the world happens for a purpose, uh, and when things don't happen for a purpose, it's probably because matter predominates over, over form and finality, and those things probably haven't been put together quite as well as they might be. Um, Aristotle is a very strongly anthropocentric teleologist in that. Um, and so we get back to ethics. Human good turns out to be an activity of the soul in conformity with excellence or virtue. Um, and so... Uh, if there's more than one excellence, human good turns out to be in conformity with the best and the most complete of those virtues. And this 
isn't just a one-off thing, what you should aim to do, and this is one of the executive best top diary quotes from the beginning, that excellence is a habit. Um, one swallow does not make a summer. That's the first time in the tradition that that line appears, I think. Nor does one day. Uh, one day or a short time does not make a man blessed or happy. And so we end up with a situation where you have a very, very practical philosophy which encourages curiosity about everything. It isn't really moralizing. Uh, it's, it, for, for those of us who come from a Christian tradition, there is absolutely no sense that there's moral right or wrong behind any of these inquiries, uh, that everything is worth explaining. And it's also extremely practical. The Aristotelian four causes I mentioned earlier, um, I use all the time. Whenever I have to give a speech at short notice and I haven't been told I need to, I think, well, you know, I'll ask the four questions. You can get out of any pickle by saying a little bit about, uh, you know, what it's made of, what it looks like, how did it come to be and what's it for. It's really, really useful. Um, and it's the same here, that Aristotle says that the purpose of life, ultimately in ethical terms, is to be the best person you possibly can be, is to reach the acme, the acme of your powers. Uh, and one of the liberating things about his philosophy is that the idea of the acme is different for different people. There's no absolute sense of right or wrong. So my acme may not be the same as Professor Iverson's acme. It may, it may be completely different. That doesn't mean that uh, they're both not good. Uh, one of the th terrible things that bedeviled me at Sydney Grammar School was this idea that the, the whole sort of private school thing where you have to pay squillions of dollars for an education led people to think that if you hadn't peaked at the age of 18 with a good ATAR, then in some sense the school had let you down. Aristotle said that, I, I think when he first started thinking about this, he said you should peak at the age of 40. I think he was about 40 when he wrote that. Uh, and he ended up saying you should peak at the age of 75. Uh, you peak when you want to peak. Uh, and there's this table in the Eudemian Ethics uh, that gives you an idea of just how practical his discussion of behaviour is. He says that you have this sense of extremes of behaviour, and if you're going to function effectively in the community, you need to find yourself a moderate path. And everyone's moderate path will look slightly differently, but he has these tables of extremes of behaviour. So at the top, uh, at one extreme, there's irascibility. You don't want to be irascible, uh, but you also don't want to show a lack of feeling. The mean, which is the aspirational um, category, is to be gentle, to be considerate. Uh, you don't want to be foolhardy, but you don't want to be a coward. So bravery is the mean. Uh, and it goes through here, lavishness and meanness. Uh, I remember trying to buy friends at North Sydney by, by Boys High School by buying their lunch for them, and it never worked. Lavishness is an extreme. Meanness is also an extreme. Liberality, working out how to be generous in the right way. And in order to answer all of these questions, you have to think not just about yourself, but how you relate to your community. Um, and there's this idea uh, in Aristotle that, that we are, in a sense, a little bit like atoms running around in, in some kind of cosmos. Um, and it's, it's, quite, it's, it's no accident, I think, that Karl Marx wrote his PhD thesis on the social consequences of the atomic theory uh, that I think Karl Marx started seeing powerful uh, analogies between seeing individuals as atoms uh, moving around in the void of the social cosmos. And so you get the idea. And what he says about individuals then can be extrapolated to the communities in which they live. Uh, so individuals, of course, aim for a good, but communities do. And the bigger the community, the more significant the state the greater the importance of the good that it aims at. Every state is a community. Every community is established with a view to some good. Everyone always acts in order to obtain that which they think is good. But if all communities aim at some good, the state or the political community, which is the highest of all and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other and at the highest good. And so... We've got here a truly remarkable philosophy, which, as I said at the beginning, licenses curiosity about everything in a completely open-ended way. Uh, it licenses 
people to examine their own behavior in a way that doesn't mean that they start crushing themselves with oppressive judgments, but it liberates them to start seeing a way in which, as individuals, they may function uh, effectively in the community. Um, and I have to say, uh, and this is where the personal side of it came in, um, the, the school I ran for nearly 20 years was very much run on Aristotelian lines. This, the, the, that having a, a view where, uh, I used to say to the boys at school, I encourage what I used to call courteous insubordination. That's a very, very Aristotelian idea. That as long as you don't hurt people, you do need to test them. You do need to disagree with them. You do need to, to try ideas out. You do need to work out whether consequences are logically reached or not. Uh, and ultimately, it's all born around this idea of phronesis, which is central to his thought. It means practical wisdom. It's not some kind of dry, sterile concept. Phronesis is practical wisdom that helps you live in a community. Uh, and the ideal that we all aim towards is something called the ideal of the megalopsuchos, the great-hearted, it's man but it's person in a modern context. We all want to be big-hearted, and to be big-hearted, it means that our hearts as well as our minds have the capacity to encompass all the possibilities that the world throws at us. Um, at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, there's a really interesting passage where he talks about the purpose of education, which in a way ties all of this together. He says that we are educated in order to understand the importance of friendship. And this is the person who sort of invented formal logic, and this is where he ends up, the importance of friendship. And he says that friendship is understood in three ways. The first is a contractual conception of friendship, a sort of legal definition of friendship, which allows you to do business. It means that you trust the people you're doing business with, that if you, you know, say to your stockbroker you're going to buy shares, the stockbroker knows that you'll pay for them. So that's a form of friendship. There's also a moral sense of friendship, almost a utilitarian one, which says that we have an obligation to look after other people in the world, and when we see someone suffering, uh, it's like guest friendship, the tradition in, in, in Greek society. When you see someone suffering, you have an obligation to do what you can to look after them. So there's a moral aspect of friendship. And then equally important is straightforward friendship, the capacity to have friends, to be mates, to keep, keep being mates with your mates and not fall out with them because you've got too busy for them or you're, you've got other interests. Uh, and so it's interesting that that ends up being one of the focal purposes of life. So if we go back to the Raphael portrait, you see the chap with the beard on the right pointing heavenwards, saying life is a preparation for death, and Aristotle saying, hey, steady on. This is actually pretty cool what we've got in front of us. Um, Aristotle is the young, youthful figure in this early 16th century representation, uh, and Plato looks as though he's just climbed off Noah's Ark. And I know who I'd rather be with. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Duncan Iverson, uh, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney, and it's my great pleasure tonight to host the question and answer session. Uh, I think. John's also proves something else that Aristotle was wrong about, which is learning does not involve necessarily pain. Um, it sometimes can be quite pleasurable. So let the pleasure continue, um, and uh, we'll open up the floor for questions. We have a roving mic so people can hear uh, on uh, the uh, live stream. Um, but maybe just to kick things off, I think there's one people can... Uh, John, just one quick sort of question from me, which is, just to reflect a bit more on why you think Aristotle remains so influential and important when he did get so many things wrong, as you put it. What is, to paraphrase someone else, you know, what's living and what's dead, do you think, in Aristotle's philosophy today? And why, is it still, why does it still persist? This is a conversation I used to have with my father all the time. Um, I, I, I think... It, it, the freshness, it, it, it's the spirit of someone who is genuinely curious, who's genuinely interested in, in going to the trouble of 
of doing research, really serious research. If you look at, the, there's a huge work called the history of researchers into animals. And he spent years going out and collecting uh, sea creatures uh, off the coast of uh, the uh, eastern Medi Mediterranean. Huge amount of work just trying to make sense of the, the, the difference in the appearances of things. It's, it's that kind of almost uh, sort of desperate desire to get to the bottom of things and, and to accept, even when the evidence doesn't fit the theory, to, to accept that there are things that haven't worked out and try and work out why that might be. Um, I remember once um, going to a lecture in Paris and there was someone who was saying, well, I mean, there's a strong uh, positivist tradition in, in French philosophy. Uh, and someone was saying, well, you know, why do you bother? He's wrong about this. Um, and, and in answer, the person said, facts are positivist banalities. Uh, in a way, it, it's beside the point whether he was right or wrong. It's, it's much more about, about the method, about the way in which he approached these things. Uh, and for me as well, growing up in a, in a very uh, Christian intellectual environment, uh, it's extraordinary having someone who is uh, approaching everything without the kind of prejudice that we often carry around with us and we're not aware of. So it reminds me, you know, we're probably being a bit unfair on Plato. I mean, you know, yeah. Macaulay famously said, uh, you know, after reading Plato, I, I can understand why they poisoned Socrates, right? I mean, there's just a different kind of style of philosophy. Um, now, there was a question just in the back. So we've got a microphone. Hi, thank you. I'll stand. Oh, yeah. um, thank you, John, uh, very much for that wonderful exposition. I wonder, looking in a, in a way mindful of phonesis and practical wisdom, I've been intrigued to ask whether or not the Nicomachean or the humanitarian ethics have anything to tell us in the age of chat and the new problems, chat, the new problems presented by AI to educators and to the world at large of uh, artificial intelligence, chat um, PTG, which seems to be a math matter of ethics, how uh, the, the technology is designed and applied raises a lot of ethical questions. What would be your view as to Aristotle's what, approach? What Aristotle would think about. Um, Aristotle has a lot to say about, uh, about the power of the mob, about the power of crowds, um, about the sources of power in, in, in the politics. Um, and I think that he may well regard the development of AI as, as a form of tyranny in waiting. Uh, he, he's terribly keen on the, uh, on the importance of preserving people's personal intellectual liberty. Uh, and, and every time uh, he comes across the idea of groupthink in any form, uh, he's quite frightened about it, except when it's his own groupthink, of course, <laughs> which is completely different. But, but I, I, I think that the closest... When I look at Twitter, when I look at what happens on social media today, when, and, and the way that, in a way, we are ruled by, by a mob of popular opinion like that, um, it, it does look quite close to some ancient analysis of, uh, of tyranny. But this is more a, a question for, for Duncan. I mean, this, is, this is your area. <laughs> your talk is not my talk. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, the one thing he, I mean, he was very keen on the wisdom of crowds, though, right? So he, unlike Plato, he did think wisdom inhered in... Sometimes. sometimes. Sometimes in the people. So he was a bit more optimistic than Plato was about crowds, but yes. the right structures and the right yes. things had to be in place. Yeah, there was a question in the front row. Uh, thanks, John. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Well, one of the things that struck me right through history, going back to uh, uh, Greek philosophy and right through to modern times, is this certain... Um, consistencies about concepts and ideas, but translated and interpreted in terms of the knowledge at the time. And the one that fascinates me is, is the idea of balance, the relationship between entities. Um, I've often wondered to what extent um, did Aristotle contribute to uh, that concept or was it something that preceded him and uh, he moved on in, in different well, I, I, I'm sure that he had a big contribution to that. Concepts of balance also uh, are related to a lot of geometrical theory, um, ideas of symmetry, 
Um, you know, in, in aesthetics, there's the development of the ideas around the golden mean, um, aesthetic beauty and so on. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, balance, but also um, the Greeks are very keen on off balance, slightly off balance. And so if you look at the early history of Greek sculpture, uh, you start to see the very earliest archaic statues. They stop showing that strict bilateral symmetry. Uh, but the way in which um, Greek thought, Greek aesthetic plays with balance is really fascinating. In politics, too, it's the mixed constitution. That's where we get yeah, the idea of yeah. the mixed constitution is from Aristotle. Right. And that goes right through the Renaissance, right through to the American founders. Uh, and, you yeah. know, the unmixed constitution of the United States is one uh, consequence of that. Other questions? Yeah, right, right here in the front. And John, as a scientist, I've always had a bit of trouble with the weight that Aristotle put on the value of thought and of the products of thought as opposed to the products of observation. Uh, and obviously, as philosophy deals with problems that are too difficult to tackle but too important to ignore, and that you have to put thought into it. But some of those problems... Uh, there was a story, I think it was A.J. Eyre, uh, that he had three wives, and he believed that women had more, more teeth than men, but he never bothered to look. This is this is like another journey with my father. We are the same, exactly the same thing. He also um, in in the medieval tradition had a uh, a girlfriend called Phyllis, uh, and she used to dress him up as a horse and ride him around the back garden. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I think that that's. In a sense, it's slightly unfair on Aristotle. A lot of people um, are surprised when they start reading Aristotle just how much, uh, what would pass for research if, uh, for a modern scientist there is. And if anyone's uh, sort of over-intellectualising things, I think it might be Plato, who, who trusts thought over the evidence of the senses to a much more extreme degree. Other questions? Oh, that's one here. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm just wondering, in a modern society, obviously time is precious and time is, uh, if you look at the young minds, you know, they're easily distracted and everything. What would you say in terms of trying to create the richness of the thinking of thoughts, but then the humanity, and then how do you actually create, create the value and then uplifting that value in our society more broadly because obviously there's mob thinking on one hand, but then the more critical thinking will be the other part to balance it out. And then sometimes your values can be very skewed. And so how do you actually counter those type of stuff? Because obviously debates get uh, stifled, and then how do you actually then elevate that debate so you can create that extra type of thinking? Yeah. Because populist beliefs can be quite scary to be on the other side of the fence. Absolutely. And another one of those little slogans at the beginning, it's the mark of an educated mind to be able to uh, entertain more, one, more than one thought at the same time. Uh, all I can, I, I can say something about my own personal experience. Um, for a long time, before Wikipedia was invented, I was a little bit like a bowerbird and I'd go and dip into lots of different things and collect fragments of knowledge. Uh, and then I had a, an extraordinary teacher in my final year at Sydney University uh, who made me sit down and read the whole of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, in Greek. And it was almost bone-crushingly boring. It was something that I, I almost couldn't endure it. Yet, in retrospect, that was one of the most significant points in my education because it taught me how to concentrate uh, and how to understand the massive architecture of, of great literature, um, of, of the sort of aspects of thought that I thought I could understand just by dipping into here and there. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that people don't really do today as much as they should is, is read and, and, and read on a grand scale, not just read all over the place, uh, but, but read really thoroughly and thoughtfully and carefully. Uh, because at the moment, there's no real possibility for nuanced discussion in, in the public arena, uh, and we just have to hope that people will make time for it in their private lives. But, I, I mean, you've put your finger on a really significant problem, I think. 
We've got one time for one more question, and I think there was a hand right at the back. Thank you. Um, you presented Aristotle's philosophy as very practical, and in his works he sets out very practical ways to carry out certain activities, such as debating in the topics and public speaking and the rhetoric. I haven't seen in the modern world anyone actually putting these into practice. And I, my question to you is, do you think, firstly, have you seen anyone who debates according to the topics or speaks according to the rhetoric or carries out scientific investigations according to the posterior analytics? And if the answer is no, do you think there's value in someone taking up that challenge after hundreds of years? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any, no, no one would ever follow anyone else's thought as a, as a blueprint for their own conduct. But it's, it's more just a glimpse of, of a, a, another way in which one might live. Uh, and, and certainly that's how I've seen its practicality. Um, so, I, you know, Aristotle writes almost unintelligible Greek. He doesn't write with verbs. Um, if I gave a speech according to his recommendations in the rhetoric, no, you know, you'd all walk out. Um, but the, the issues, the methodological issues, the problems he raises are actually uh, very easy to extrapolate inductively into a modern context. Uh, and so I think that's where the practicality lies. Um, if you read it, it just it says, oh, this makes sense. I can, I can understand that there's a human mind here trying to make sense of things. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be, I don't live in the same context and same world. It's a completely different planet. But there is something across all those thousands of years that's still fresh enough for me to be able to, lose, to, to learn from it. Thank you very much, Don. Um, now, my pleasure to invite Susan Pond, President of the Royal Society, to offer the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening. We've been privileged tonight to listen to John Valance and his interlocutor, uh, Duncan Iverson, both philosophers. We have uh, an audience that ranges from university students to people who are octogenarians and that shows the relevance of the subject that we've spoken tonight. We're privileged to enjoy the patronage of our uh, patron, who is a sneaky guest tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending, and our Lieutenant Governor, who's our official host. Uh, and I thank them and all the staff of Government House for making tonight so successful. It shows the society off in its very best colours. Our 1881 Act, which is 60 years after the foundation of the Society by Sir Thomas Brisbane, whose portrait hangs out in the uh, main entry, reads, The Royal Society of New South Wales was formed in the colony of New South Wales for the encouragement of studies and investigations in science, art, literature and philosophy. We've covered all of those topics tonight and... Uh, John has brought them to be relevant to our modern lives. I was uh, taking photographs of some of the slides because they ring so true. John, you've taken us deep into philosophy, deep into the mind of Aristotle and explained your title uh, of uh, sub the sublunary sphere and explained how Aristotle complex uh, writings uh, in terms that we can all understand. I was speaking to our interlocutor, Duncan Iverson, one day at the University of Sydney about the aspirations of my grandchildren, and I was ticking off scientist, engineer, prime minister, CEO of the World Bank. Duncan stopped me and looked me uh, at me very gently, very politely, and pointed out that at least one of them should be a philosopher. I think we all understand why he said that. So thank you, John, for your inspiring presentation, and thank you, uh, Duncan, uh, for 
extending our horizons, making us realise why we're all here, why the society is here, why our partnership with Government House is so important. Thank you.